please welcome to the stage AJ Chopra. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Ajay Chopra. I'm with Trinity Ventures, uh, a leading venture capital firm in Silicon Valley. And we invest in a broad array of companies in consumer uh, as well as enterprise areas. Today, I'm delighted to introduce uh, three pioneers in their respective industries. They're actually disrupting three major sectors, uh, the uh, automobile sector, the education sector, and the real estate sector. So I'm really delighted to host them. First up is Ernie Garcia. Uh, who is uh, here to talk about his company, Open Door. Ernie? Hey guys, I'm Ernie. Um, so I've got two quick minutes to describe Carvana. So uh, what we do is we sell cars online. Uh, you can go to our website. We have about 10,000 different cars there. You can pick the car that you want. You can get approved for and select financing. Uh, you can select a delivery time. We deliver the car to your door. Uh, by virtue of making the whole platform self-service where customers can take care of the whole thing themselves, we save customers about 1,500 bucks. Um, and the crux of the business is just to make it as simple as possible for consumers. I think when we tell people we sell cars online, everyone says that's really cool. And they tend to focus on the business model of being kind of an e-commerce automotive retailer. I think our entire focus has been, how do we build a business that gives customers great experiences? And we decided that reducing costs and making things easier is what customers really needed. And so we built a business to do that. Um, and we're excited to talk more, but I am disappointed because Uj has a boy band mic and I have a regular mic, which is a, a terrible fact for me. But <laughs> introduce the next guy. Awesome. Th thanks very much, uh, Ernie. Uh, thanks for the quick introduction. Next up is Vish Makanji. Uh, Vish is the CEO of Udacity based in Silicon Valley. He oversees all of the company's operations to democratize education around the world. He has been instrumental in the development of Udacity's nano degrees, and he'll talk about that. Vish? Step up here. All right, cool. Hi, I'm Vish Makajani, CEO of Udacity. Udacity's mission is to democratize education. And what that means for us is we help people get jobs. Uh, we focus it in areas that are in really high demand, areas like machine learning, uh, deep learning, self-driving cars, flying cars, and those kinds of things. We also do it in more pedestrian ways if you just want to become a developer. Um, we focus mostly on areas that help you become an engineer of some kind, uh, but we've been branching out into things like digital marketing as well. Uh, we operate on a global basis. Uh, you can't democratize education only by doing it in the United States. So we have operations in China, India, uh, the Middle East, Europe, and in Sao Paulo. Uh, and we recently have crossed 50,000 students. So it's an exciting time in the company. Next right there. Next up is uh, JD Ross. Uh, JD co-founded uh, Open Door, uh, and he's focused on developing better experiences for people to buy homes. He has led the company's growth team and product teams and is integral to Open Door's uh, mission to modernize the real estate industry. JD, come on up. Yeah, right there. Right. So Open Door was founded in 2014 with the mission of completely reinventing how people sell and buy their home. Uh, you come to our site, enter your address, tell us about upgrades, what work you've done, and that day we're going to make you a full market value cash offer on your home, which you can sell in as little as three days, but on your timeline. And the timeline piece there is really, really important because most people need to sell their home before they can buy their next home. And so what we do is we unlock that equity so that they can then make an offer on their next home without having to do the renovations, repairs, open houses, all that pain that comes in that. So it's one move instead of two. You don't need to rent a house. You don't need to move in with your in-laws. It's a single transaction. Um, and what's cool there is people then say, okay, well, so like, what's the catch? What do you actually offer? Is it fair market value? Like, what's your discount? Well, we're, we're not a hedge fund. We're, we're a consumer-obsessed business. Uh, we offer full market value, and that's really important because people know what their home is worth. They're not going to take an offer for less than market value, and, they're, and if we offer more than market value, then uh, we're not a business. We're some terrible charity or some failing business. So accuracy is critical to the business, and we have 100 data scientists and engineers working every day to produce that really accurate offer. Uh, we started this year at four markets. We're now at eight. We'll double again by the end of the year and uh, end the year somewhere around $8 billion in run rate, um, growing really, really fast. And uh, I think what's interesting is people say, how big can this business grow? Is, it, is, it possible to, is this like a niche thing? 
in our first three weeks in San Antonio, we're already at 1% market share. We're at a significant multiple of that in the real estate markets than the ones we've been in. I think this is probably a very, this is the way people will sell and buy their homes in the future, similar to how people trade in their cars. Thanks, JD. So we'll uh, um, go through some questions here and then open up to the audience if you've got time. Uh, starting with you, Ernie, um, can you just talk a little bit about, you know, the car market is very competitive. How do you guys distinguish yourself and in, in specific, how do you acquire customers in this competitive market? Yes, yeah, so I, I think um, the competition automotive retail, I think, is what leads to experiences that are so painful for consumers. I think all these businesses are doing things largely the same way. They're buying cars from the same sources. They're, you know, on the same real estate. They're building buildings that are mandated by manufacturers. So I think what we've tried to do is just totally differentiate the underlying cost structure of the business so that we can make things way easier. And I think that's, that's the whole goal of everything that we do is we've tried to just build a business model that ultimately leads to great customer experiences. And so that's how we differentiate ourselves. I think um, if the underlying hypothesis is reduce costs to try to drive a better customer experience, you have to look at where dealers are spending money, and they spend money in three principal areas. One is kind of the labor associated with selling you a car, one is the physical dealership itself, and then one is definitely customer acquisition. And what we've tried to do is build customer acquisition into the model by both making the customer experience better, which then drives kind of more referrals, but then also we have these you know, crazy vending machines that look like they make no sense, but actually make a ton of economic sense if you check them out, um, that drive a ton of customers to us as well. And so it, we've built basically these you know, huge, literally like 10 story car vending machines that sit next to highways uh, and just draw a ton of eyeballs and, and drive a ton of traffic to our website. And then we use that same asset to deliver a really cool differentiated customer experience, which I think is you know, one of the kind of uh, customer acquisition hacks that we've come across. That's awesome. So is that a hack that you started early on in your company's evolution or is that something that you have more recently uh, done? So I would say conceptually, um, from the very beginning, we kind of started with this like, let's build an experience that's differentiated and better, and then that's gonna be the way that we're gonna drive down customer acquisition costs because we have something real to say to consumers. It's not about finding an interesting shtick or like a line that sounds good and is repeatable or a jingle, and that's how we're gonna get customers. We're gonna build a better business. So I think that was kind of foundational. I think we ran into uh, the vending machine uh, in, in a more circumstantial way, uh, which, which was very lucky for us. We realized it worked, and so we started to build more of them. Oh, that's cool, that's very cool. So Vish, um, your mission is to democratize education, uh, and one of the things that you have launched is nano degrees. Can you talk about that a little bit? And I think in particular, I'm just wondering whether that leads to better job opportunities for folks that are going through your curriculums. Sure, when uh, Sebastian and I, about almost five years ago, tried to figure out what we would sell, capitalizing on his uh, really successful free, cross, free class launch of his AI course at uh, Stanford, we, we were making a bet, we ultimately decided to make a bet on lifelong learning, and the idea is, is that you're, you know, with the way technology moves, you're gonna have to re-educate yourself every five to seven years with sub a substantial new set of skills. And so with that as a vision, we created this thing called a nano degree, so you couldn't afford, you know, if that was the, the construct, you couldn't afford to go get a master's degree every five to seven years. It had to be small enough that you could consume it, but enough meaningful set of skills that they were material enough to give you that next great job. And that's kind of how we think about everything we do. So we've unpacked the education experience by trying to do it in the most efficient and effective way we can for the student, with the North Star being that that person like up levels themselves, either with a new job or a promotion at their existing company. And so nano degrees have started to kind of get a little bit of a hold. So we launched them this fall will be four years ago. And I'd say in the last year, uh, a key signal has really kind of lit up for us, which is companies signing up to recruit our students. So we, we more than double that uh, just in the past six, eight months. So we went from like 50 companies to over 120 companies. Kirsten leads that effort right there in the crowd. And so um, that's been a key marker for us saying that, oh, folks are actually really interested in our students, which is what we care about. So is that how you measure success of the nano degrees through the placements that? Uh... Yeah, I mean, we obviously have a bunch of metrics because that's a very lagging metric, yeah. as you might imagine, yeah. right? So we care about all the things from yeah. how students get excited to sign up and start that journey but we also place a ton of effort on taking somebody's inspiration and turning that into perspiration for them too, right? So, you know, early criticisms, somewhat legitimate about online learning were that you just had really low completion rates. Uh, in the last six months in particular, we've made like serious dents on that. And some of it is kind of using, we were talking about this backstage, kind of traditional techniques of like accountability, support, deadlines, all those kinds of things. Right, awesome. JD, uh, turning to real estate, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's, you know, you guys have taken a very bold move in that market where you actually acquire the property at your own risk. 
Um, and then, you know, at some point later you sell it, so you're carrying the, the burden over several months sometimes, right? So how, do you, how did you think about that in terms of risk management for your company? Yeah, I think a couple of things about it. So it is a bit crazy that we actually do purchase the homes and hold them on our balance sheet. But we think about risk in a few ways. One is from a customer experience standpoint. During a downturn, people need that liquidity more than they need it today yeah. because they still have a new kid. They still have a new job. So enabling that economic mobility in those times is incredibly important to us and I think one of the major benefits of Open Door. Managing risk through that is also very important. Real estate doesn't move like the stock market. You don't see a 10% drop in a day. Uh, even in the worst period of 2008, 2009, you have Las Vegas, which over the course of three months lost about 10%. In those same three months across eight markets, which is the number of markets we're in today, uh, you saw about a 2.5%, 3% drop. So by diversifying, having really kind of keen awareness of where markets are moving, and right. you can see it early because real estate does move slowly, right. we can reprice as we kind of sell and buy new homes and kind of be ahead of that while still providing that experience to people who need it in that moment. And you feel that model will work even when the real estate market goes through a downturn? So right now we're in, at a macro level, a very appreciating market. Right. But there are sub-geographic areas within Phoenix, within Dallas, that have depreciated while we've owned homes there. And our pricing and profitability have been more or less indistinguishable between the macro city as a whole and that specific area depreciating. So I think that gives us some confidence that even in those, er those times in those areas, we, we can price accurately. Going back to your, when we were backstage, we were talking about, you know, one of the things that you've done with your company is to sort of bring in the, the car DNA. Your dad had a big car practice from what I understand. Uh, and combined with Silicon Valley DNA, you went to Stanford. So can you talk about how companies sometimes that are disrupting traditional industries such as cars, kind of like don't do that and, and sort of fall into, into uh, trouble? And how you've successfully done that in your company by bringing talent from both sides, technology, as well as knowledge of the industry, like the automotive industry. Sure. Well, so I think um, when you're trying to start a company, you have to have an idea about how you're going to differentiate yourself, and then you have to be able to move relatively quickly and efficiently because you have constrained capital, and, and that's really difficult. I think, you know, all too often there's, uh, you know, founders of companies come from outside of industries, and I think the benefit that founders from outside of industries have is they have a fresh perspective on things, and so they're willing to look at problems in a totally new way, and I think that enables real disruption. A cost, though, of that approach is that you don't know a lot of things that are really obvious to people that are inside of an industry. I think you know we were lucky enough to where we did understand automotive retail and automotive finance and the whole ecosystem really, really well, but we also were able to attract a lot of people that had very disruptive mindsets, and we were able to merge those you know, two viewpoints together to say, let's look at things in a fresh way, but let's be able to cut all the corners we're able to cut because we understand the industry. And I think you know, that's in stark contrast to the company that I tried to found prior to this, where I knew nothing about any of the businesses surrounding it. And you know, in a year, I blew all of my personal money and was unable to raise any money from anyone because I had no clue what I was doing. And I think that, you know, that, that's a, that, that was something that I definitely learned that I think is valuable. It's like it's important to be able to move quickly, and you can move faster if you understand the industry you're in because there are so many decisions that you have to make that take a lot of time if you're going to try to learn them from scratch. Uh, but if, if you can come with a little knowledge, it's very helpful. Wish, uh, turning to education, uh, you know, you have uh, essentially taken the tech education from sort of the Western world and taken it global. What are some of the third world countries where that, where that has taken roots? Um, and I was just curious as to what percentage of your students are international, especially in third world countries? Yeah, uh, so international has been a huge opportunity for us, but I think uh, it also points to how different markets are as it relates to the state of education in those markets. In fact, our businesses are quite distinct in every market that we're in. Uh, part of it was too, there's a little bit of self-serving here, I think, in that um, we wanted to hire really good entrepreneurs because we thought these markets were gonna be different. When you hire entrepreneurs, you're going to get different outcomes in different places. Uh, as a result, you know, our business in China is more high-end geared. Like if you look at what we, we have 24, 25 programs right now. The China business is almost all the high end of that. You contrast that with our business in Brazil, which is all intro. Right, our digital marketing program is our most successful program there too. So it speaks to the different states, and frankly, like I, I think the quality of the entrepreneur we have in those places. Uh, one of the one of the areas I'm most proud about is our work in Saudi Arabia. Actually, so we're working with uh, the Crown Prince's Misk Foundation, and you know we're we're delivering a slightly different product there. It's kind of what I'd call mid-range, so like not super early, but kind of uh, early for a developer in their career. Um, and we have a slight in-person element to it there. And our 
our students are more than half women there too. So it's a, oh, that's our business looks very, very different no matter where it is around the world. That's awesome. So JD, I'm going to ask you a question about uh, your experiences as the company grew and evolved. Uh, is there one anecdote you can tell us where the company faced an existential threat, something that you know, could have put the company out of business? Um, and how did, you, how did you deal with that and, and continue on your path to success? So I, I, the, I think in any company, as you, as you grow, you face an innumerable number of existential threats or moments where the company's about to fail. And I, I think, in general, you just learn that if you've solved the past ones and you continue and you have the team you have, yeah. Even if you don't know the solution, you can look back and say, oh, we, we did that. We can do that again. We just need to keep banging the head against the whiteboard until it breaks. Um, so I'll, I'll talk one about one that I think today is really relevant. When we, when we enter a market, people hear about our model. It's very different than how you normally would sell and buy a house today. And so people try to find the best association they can, and that's like home flipping. But we're not home flippers. We're, we, we don't run a hedge fund. We, we don't know how to, uh, we don't buy low and sell high. We, we offer fair market value and charge for our service. And so coming in and being able to say what we're not takes away from what we are and makes it harder for us to get going in those markets. And I think what we learned is we shouldn't fight that battle up front. It's much better just to deliver an amazing blow people's mind service for the first couple of customers and then let them tell everyone they know. And relying on word of mouth instead of trying to fight that fight up front and just letting the, the product take care of itself has saved us a lot of headaches and a lot of problems. And now even in our first our new markets, you have that compounding effect from existing cities where you know, our first three weeks in San Antonio, we went from zero to 1% market share. Uh, our first 100 days in Raleigh Durham, we bought 100 houses. Like, it, it's getting easier, but it's getting easier because of Got it. Yeah. experience. Yeah. So Ernie, last question for the panel from, from you, uh, for you, uh, to the reverse of what I asked him, which is, was there an opportunity you came across as you were scaling your company that you leveraged to really scale faster? Oh man, was there, I, I think to be honest, I think we faced a lot of opportunities to, to go a different direction we stayed the course. I think we had um, opportunities to partner with um, existing big retailers um, or, or maybe even manufacturers to deliver kind of an e-commerce uh, you know, software layer, which obviously would have scaled really well. Um, we faced a lot of pressure from investors early on. We were struggling to get traction to build dealerships and then to try to have like dealerships with the best possible software layer. Um, and I think you know we were able to hold the course through some really really difficult moments there, and, and just kind of stayed with the vision that we had from the beginning. Um, so I don't know that we I think we settled on a number of things like the vending machine that kind of helped to accelerate things. Um, but I think the story of Carvana and how we were able to kind of make it through I, I think had more to do with staying the course in in difficult moments than um, intelligently pivoting. Well, thank you very much, panelists. I'm inspired by what you have done in your respective industries and your success. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you.